David Dameron, founder, Detrapel, appears on Shark Tank, show 058. Let me find Mark Cuban's email and email him. And so okay. I got his email. I, I did a lot of surfing, um, found like four different email addresses for him and guessed a few of them. And eventually I sent him an email and he responded to me. And, it, you know, I was kind of introducing the product and he said, go ahead and make some and see if they sell. And I guess that I kind of came across, I emailed him in like, I think it was January, February, right when we launched to the market in 2014. And, uh, he said, why don't you go ahead and make some and see if they sell? And I, you know, responded and said, they are selling. And I mentioned Shark Tank. Hey there, trusted friends. I'm Mitchell Chadro, the host of the Listen Up Show and the MitchellChadro.com podcast, where I interview startups, business owners, and leaders, along with the entrepreneurs on how they built their businesses and start it up. I saw in the news on an update that he was actually going to be on and appearing on the ABC reality TV show Shark Tank. So I invited him back today. He just got a capital investment from not just one shark, but two for 25% of the company for 200000 both from Mark Cuban, the billionaire Maverick owner, and Lori Grenier, the QVC queen, who took an ownership stake in his company, with a third shark, Barbara Corcoran, the real estate maven, convincing him that this was the best deal on the table among all the sharks. So this is a pivot on how he got on the show, how he raised that capital, and how going forward he's transforming the product, how this compares to the previous version of his company. David, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks, Mitchell. It's wonderful being here. Let's jump right in. I'm actually going to go full steam ahead. I know we spoke about this the last time generally, but let's start up with the revenue for 2017 versus the revenue here for 2018. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So in 2017, we were going to be on track to finish off the year, and we did do so at about 300 to between 350,000. And since the airing last Sunday uh, on the 7th of January 2018, we did 100K in 24 hours. And then since then, we're approaching 200K pretty quick. And that's just direct consumer sales online. That's not including anything wholesale. That's not including anything um, B2B, which is what we mainly focus on. So it's been going well. That's truly amazing. I, I know that we had also spoke a little bit about your revenue back in 2016. I don't know if that was closer to the 60000 mark, but is that 350000 mark, is that gross revenue as opposed to your net profit margin? Sure, that is gross. Uh, however, our net is very high. Uh, on the gross margin, we have usually between, if you include shipping costs, we're still making a 70% markup when we include free shipping on um, gross. But if, it, if you're going to be interested in anything else, then, you know, on the gross margin without shipping, we're making between like 80 to 88% of most of our products. It's, um, it's pretty interesting how we are able to keep such a high margin uh, by cutting out a lot of costs and sourcing the right way. In terms of net, we still end up having a bottom line because we're a very lean company. Um, we're in the 60th percentile, between 50 to 60. The last time you were on the show, we, we talked a little bit about your partnerships, the B2B, and I know that you want to do a little bit more, obviously, direct-to-consumer. Can you talk to us a little bit about the partnerships that you've been able to create uh, since the last time you were on? Yeah, um, it's been a while, but you know, we've been able to pursue a lot of brands that are interested in keeping things protected, whether that's you know, like fabrics, like what we've traditionally done, or we've extended the product line to nine different products, which I'll talk more about later. But essentially, uh, we've been able to partner with companies or do test runs with companies like Volkswagen, for example. Um, and we're dealing with larger corporations that are interested in kind of protecting, you know, the their products or whatever they're offering, their services, and offering that to the end consumer. You know, a lot of the young entrepreneurs out there that are starting their own business, businesses want to know, so how did you actually create some of those partnerships? And can you talk to us about a few key partnerships that you've been able to establish and how you were able to actually go ahead and establish those? Sure. So it all started, you know, two years ago when I was just 15. Uh, when I was just starting the business, and personally, you know, when you're that young, one, you're not thinking about business, but two, you're not really taking seriously either. Um, I think I've always had this kind of mentality where, you know, people are going to take you seriously if you're serious about it yourself. And I think that's even evident in the Shark Tank episode, where, you know, when I when they asked me how old I was, 
and I said I was 19, they they thought I was they thought I was 30. So um, it's definitely been uh, kind of like an interesting ride trying to um, you know per- persist and, and convince companies essentially that we're still a serious full-blown company despite you know being such a young company. So the company actually gets started back in or it launches back in 2013. The product goes to market in 2014. So what has been the biggest complaint that your users had at that time in order for you to get them to sort of move on to your product? What was the solution? What was the com- main complaint that they had in, in terms of what was going on to, to sort of make them look to your product? Yeah, so I guess the biggest problem that we had was we couldn't sell the product to consumers um, because for many years we, we couldn't get the formula right. At first, when we launched in 2014, if you recall, I think I mentioned this in a previous episode of the show, we had a manufacturer that added a proprietary part to the formulation, and we weren't able to re-engineer it when they went bankrupt, and they refused to disclose it to us. So we had a big issue, and, and without that proprietary part, the formula was drying white. It was ruining the texture of fabric. And we contracted 12 different labs across the U.S. and abroad, and none of which were able to do it. We fled like you know $100,000 of my own personal money into the company, into R&D, and we weren't able to do anything from it. And so I guess it was in 2017, early, early like January, I realized, you know, home from break from school because I'm in college, um, and I realized that the only way to really get this done is by doing it myself. So I got back into the first lab that I used four years ago, four and a half years ago, to create the first iteration of the formulation. And we re-engineered it again and have since then relaunched the consumer market. So now it's a product that we have two safety certification on, meaning it's not toxic, it's fully biodegradable, it's eco-friendly. It, it, it dries completely clear, doesn't ruin the texture, but that's just the fabric part of it as well. That's not the main thing. The main thing is that the longevity and all of our coatings really focus on this durable material that we're making this durable kind of coating, protective coating that will stop from anything kind of harming the material that you spray it on. So essentially the goal is we provide the longest lasting and the most effective formulas in the coating industry. Let's go back a little bit to the partnerships that I had mentioned before. I know that you had mentioned one in particular, but in terms of getting the product, you know, in terms of your distribution channels going forward and your strategy in terms of getting the product into retailers, can can you talk to us a little bit about that and maybe name a few key uh, retailers or what your strategy is going forward? Sure. Um, B2C isn't really the biggest play for us. We think we have a great opportunity right now to pursue it. However, the real goal for us is B2B. Um, but nonetheless, the retail side is more so companies like Ace Hardware, someone that we just signed an exclusivity agreement with. So we're going to potentially pursue that. Um, and we're looking for really more so online sales and driving consumers through our website than we are for just retail, just simply because retail, I'm, I'm sure people are understanding right now, you know, retail is not at its all-time high. It's slowly dying, and unfortunately, a lot of the things that we see with retail is, you know, business owners aren't at a beneficial factor by going into retail. Yes, you'll get more eyes on your product, per se, but, you know, that all depends on self space. That depends on a lot of different things, and for us particularly, B2C and, and retail specifically is more focused on the small shop as opposed to large shops. Of course, we're going to approach customers like Walmart or something like that, but at first, we're thinking of companies that are, for example, um, we just signed a deal with a, con- with a company that has 150 stores over the U.S., and they focus on uh, selling to doctors and nurses, like materials or, like, you know, things that they would need, like clothing, for example, to, like, scrub. And so we just signed a deal with them, and, you know, Deals like that are, are also six-figure deals, but they're easier to deal with simply because the companies will pay you up front. They don't, you know, you still can deal on your terms instead of their terms. And it's not a Walmart that can dictate how much you should be selling it to them for. You, you mentioned Ace Hardware, and, and you also mentioned uh, the uh, the scrubs and, you know, working with uh, the medical profession. Can you, A, tell us who that might be, and then, B, tell us a little bit about how you were able to structure the deal generally and sort of at least get your foot in the door to even have the opportunity of an exclusivity, whether it be with ACE or, or this other example that you just provided. Sure. So specifically with ACE, right, it's, a, it's an exclusivity tied to just the hardware industry. So, you know, with them, it's, you can't go to Home Depot, for example, and Lowe's, which for us is not that big an issue. Um, and it really depends, again, like if, if the call or if the 
if it doesn't end up working out with the base, it's our call to do whatever we want. But essentially, striking a deal like that um, was interesting because we, we went through a different platform. There's a platform called The Gromit, which is a consumer-focused platform for new products and startup companies. Um, it's an online... And what is the name of that? What is the name of that name? platform? The Gromit. It's a platform where pretty much like new products are launched almost every single day, and they have 2 million daily active subscribers, and they just partnered a, they just struck a deal where their partnership is with Ape on the wholesale level, and so being affiliated with the Gromit, we're actually launching there uh, the third week of February or so. Um, we get that beneficial aspect of being able to partner with Ape as well. Um, I got you. So you have the relationship with them, and they bring you the entree into coming into all these uh, various locations. Right, as well as being on their actual platform, which is the, the main goal here. Sure. As far as you had mentioned about wanting, obviously, consumers to come to your site, and obviously each uh, industry is different, but I, I know that the audience would be really interested in knowing what your major ways are to sort of bring people to your site since that's that's going to be your main focus, at least at least in the uh, interim. Yeah, so we're doing a couple things there. Um, shortly after the kind of the buzz dies down from Shark Tank, because that's obviously been a huge plus for us, we're looking at actually kind of disassociate uh, Death Repel and make that kind of like the all-around brand and then make sub-brands under each product, essentially, because we have, you know, these different products, nine different products that are very different. And our fabric protector, which is more, you know, towards the regular consumer that could use, is not necessarily something that a consumer or that, you know, is not appealing with all the other products. So not every company is going to want the fabric protector. So essentially what we're going to do, what we plan on doing, is kind of creating these sub-brands that will run their own way. So we'll have a brand that's on the consumer aspect towards the streetwear side. So we'll be doing a lot of marketing, a lot of press pushing on that to drive those e-commerce sales because that's kind of the best way to, the, the, hot, the lowest hanging fruit. Um, after that, it's really about being able to have consumers come to the website for other things. But, you know, we want to be able to make sure that each market is marketed effectively. So that means making videos or having press that's associated with that industry. So I can't necessarily have, you know, if I'm going to look for industrial clients or B2B clients, I can't be going on Good Morning America and pitching the fabric protector. So it's about segmenting it correctly. And, you know, we're still, we're still working on that. It's, it's kind of early just because we've been in this position with, with Shark Tank. It's been an amazing ride so far. Um, so we're kind of – And we're going to – and we're certainly going to get into that in a little bit. Now let's listen up to our Startup Round sponsor. Today's Startup Round sponsor is Startup Smarter, and their website is – StartupSmarter.com. So to start your business, start up smarter in three easy steps. One, they help you find a business to start up. Two, create your own business idea. And three, get your first customers to buy. It's super easy. My listeners can actually post their businesses on StartupSmarter.com slash Mitchell. So if you head on over to StartupSmarter.com slash Mitchell and you sign up, you'll actually be able able to post your business right on their website. You can book a call today with one of Startups Smarter team members by going over to startupsmarter.com. Now, back to our show. Like a lot of our startups and, and business owners who are obviously taking their companies to the next level, we also talk about focus. So it, it sounds as if, you know, I know the last time we, we kind of spoke, you know, you, your main focus obviously was on the main product, Etropel. And I'm now hearing you talk about some of these other products that you're sort of, you know, wanting to sort of introduce. So how does one stay focused? And yet it sounds as if you're going to be putting a lot of R&D and a lot of research and development into some of these other products. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, from a business strategy perspective, you know, how you're going to sort of do that and yet still focus on, on the main product, which is, is really how Detrapel got started. Sure. So. Our goal is not to necessarily segment it by product, but by segmenting it towards industry or focus, like you mentioned. So essentially, it all comes down to two different focuses, the B2C side versus the B2B side for us. And what we plan on doing is by segmenting 
the B to C versus the B to B, you can have someone, especially if it's a completely different entity, which is now this is like Spark Essence, and this is something that we're considering doing within the next two months, but making the B to C side still associated with Bexpel, but assuming it's a, it's a different entity, say, you know, like Fabric Protector by Deathrapel instead of just being Deathrapel. Uh, and is this a different formulation? Is it a different, I mean, obviously the name of the product is different. Uh, the look of the bottling is going to be different. Um, the formula itself is going to be, I don't know if it, if it works off of the same, uh, the same type of formula, but c- can you talk to us about that? Because, y- you know, now you're putting resources yeah. in some other, other areas and, and other formulations. Yeah, well, these formulations are kind of set in stone. So, like, the current thousand protector that we sell, it's still going to be the same formulation. It's just going to be, you know, labeled or, or named differently for that time being. Uh, for that specific market. And that's strictly so that we can segment customers towards that industry and have other people kind of run that side of the business, essentially. Like we'll, we'll get the manpower to run essentially with a different entity, but at the same time, it's still under the Detropel umbrella, you know? And then Sure. The Tell side, us a little bit about some of the products that you currently have now, and maybe by giving examples as to the different types of industries and who some of those customers are, I think, would be very helpful and, and, uh, and you know, illustrative. Yeah, sure. So we segment our products based on the material. Essentially, all of the coatings are protective coatings. So we have a fabric protector specifically for fabric and leather. Then we have something for metal and stainless steel. We have wood and timber. We have synthetic and plastic protection. Then we have other formulations, such as the glass and ceramic and kind of the big thing that we're about to start pushing is this product that we have, which is an anti-corrosion, an anti-fouling for boats, and an anti-graffiti. Essentially, what we show with testing and, and videos and whatnot, we have, for the anti-graffiti specifically, we'll have a metal sheet where half of it is sprayed and half of it isn't. And the half that isn't sprayed, you can see when spray paint is sprayed, it completely stays on and the metal sheet turns blue. Whereas on the other half, side by side, when you're spraying it and, it, and you spray the side that is coated with our anti-graffiti formulation, the spray paint completely just starts dripping off. So, you know, gain some imagination, all of our coatings are protective coatings, and that's what it's really based on. The way that we switch up the branding is based on the material, because that's kind of what, you know, a, a consumer that might need to kind of put stuff on their wood, hardwood floors, it's not going to be the same customer that needs an anti-graffiti product, and the price points are different, the formulations are different. So we have nine different formulas, but some but, of them... But, but not only nine different so formulas, are you working, you're working with the, obviously the, the, the same, the same lab or the same people that are, that are putting that together yeah. for you, as well as nine different bottlings, nine different brand names. Um, how, how are you managing all of that? Sure. Well, like I said, for B two B, right? We don't we don't deal with consumer size packaging. Those are one off orders. They're made to order. They're in down containers. So for that, that's that's relatively easy for us. We attach, you know, our instructional sheets, our safety data sheets, all of that, and send the gallon to a consumer who's ordering, or to you know, to a, a client who's ordering on the B two B side. On the B two C side, though, we do have three products currently. Like if you went on our website today, you would be able to directly buy on our website three products, being the fabric protector, which is a two ounce bottle. Then we have the vehicle interior protector, which is the same formula, but in a five-ounce bottle. And then there's the vehicle exterior protector, which is a polish and seal as well for the exterior of your car. And essentially, just so you understand, right, we have this for cars, but it can also be used for boats. So in the B2B side, this formula is used for boats, whereas on the B2C side, it's used for cars and, and other things. So we're able to differentiate and the packaging and, and all the R&D simply by market. So it's not that hard when you think about it holistically to, to view this because essentially what we do is we buy, you know, large amounts, for example, like we'll, we'll create large amounts of a fabric protector. And for those customers that want to buy it for car, like for example, if you have a carpet company that's applying it in the manufacturing process, they'll buy it in the gallon. So all we do is, you know, repackaging gallons, put our labels on, put everything out there and send it out. And then if a consumer like yourself wants to go and buy it, they just go on the website and we have the two ounce models already ready and you can just go ahead and purchase it directly. And but are, but you're calling it something new. other than Detrapel, correct? So, I mean, does it depend? I mean, you know, if I'm a right consumer, I want to – brand. Gotcha. Okay. Now it's, yeah, right now it's all under the same brand. But essentially what we want to do is differentiate it so we can sure. market it differently because we don't want our B2B clients coming to our B2C-oriented website, you know? Absolutely. So, so right now, though, both the consumer and the B2B market are coming directly to the detrapel.com 
website, correct? Yeah, and what you'll see is when you click on our website, there's a in the header, there's products, and when you hover over products, um, you'll see that it asks you consumer, industrial, and retail. And so, or you can go buy now and scroll down, and you'll see all the products we offer, including the B2B formulations, including the formulas that we don't have consumer packaging for, which are custom order. So we do sell those, but it's at the, you know, it's at a higher cost for one gallon, which covers a tremendous amount of surface area. So it isn't the easiest thing to do, but at the same time, you know, we already have this product in-house. We make it ourselves, and we buy the raw material from our from our lab. And all we do, you know, is differentiate the packaging, essentially, and our, and our marketing thus far. Now, I, I know that since the last time you came on, you've done some uh, tremendous updates to the website. Do you have a graphic designer that you're working with uh, to help you sort of maintain this and sort of build it up? Yeah, so we do everything in-house ourselves. We have a content creator, Tom Leary, um, amazing at what he does, amazing with his hands, amazing with the camera. Um, he does all of our videography, all of our graphic design, all of our content creation, and essentially he's stepping up to be, or he is, our head of marketing and head of cre- creative development. So he takes care of pretty much all of that Um the guy who creates the design, and then me and Steven, who's the head of our business development, he'll go ahead and actually implement things. So Steven, for example, is the one that we did our website. And as you just mentioned, it's a completely new design. I mean, it's entirely different than what our Yeah, no, it looks was. it looks real nice. The, the colors are real nice. He, he did a fantastic job because, you know, a, a lot of the people that listen to the show also have their own businesses. They're looking for their own graphic designers. Just out of curiosity, who do you who do you host your your website through? Is it is it still the same same one that you did the last time, or are you using someone different? No, so we did switch. We currently we used to use Squarespace, which is great for if you want something like a like a blog Correct. or maybe like a one off product, um, and it's pretty affordable. But we switched over to Wix, uh, which is definitely so far out of all the e commerce platforms that I've personally done, and I've done at least six of them, including Shopify. Um, and I've also had completely custom coded websites as well. And we, we personally really, really enjoy using the Wix platform. I mean, it is so versatile. You can literally do whatever you want and you do not need to know how to code, even though some of our team members do know how to. Um, so if you want to implement custom code, you can do so as well. Um, Wix itself is not that expensive. It's a pretty good, it, it's standard pricing and you can get, you know, you can upgrade if you want other, uh, services, but they host all their service through Amazon Web Services, which the majority of companies do. Um, so hosting-wise, they have, you know, a top-tier brand behind them. And in terms of building the website, their website builder is just phenomenal. Now, I also see here that since the last time we spoke, uh, you know, it says here Fox, Fox Networks, NBC. Uh, obviously, you're continuing to go to Babson College, and we'll talk to you about that in a little bit, CBS. So tell us how you've been able to now – you know, before we get into Shark Tank, how, how you were able to sort of get into all of those uh, media outlets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big thing that I think we as a team were able to do um, before we even got on Shark Tank was, you know, get good press and levitate the right press toward us. And the way that it essentially happened is, you know, we pitched the story of the company and the founder, obviously me. Um, <laughs> that's, that's exactly we right. The story of, <laughs> yeah, but we pitched the story of how it started, the age, all these critical components which make it, you know, not just an everyday type of story. I mean, with all due respect to everyone, I mean, it, it, it's not often that you hear of someone who's 15, for example, and running a chemical coatings company. And, you know, and I'm not trying to boast my own horn at all here, but, you know, what, what we're trying to say is essentially that you have to find what your key factor is, what's so unique about you and the story or even the company. And you can go ahead and reach out to various press outlets. And as soon as you get one, especially if it's like a, a local or a national one, if there's a snowball effect of press. Every other press outlet wants to interview. You. I mean, and it just keeps going on. So, you know, beyond the podcast, beyond the kind of super local concentrated press where you have someone who has their own listeners, you want to go to maybe like your local network um, or maybe like a, a contributor for Huffington Post or something like that. And we personally stay away from press releases. We haven't found press releases to be helpful whatsoever because what will happen is, you know, you, you release a statement and these press outlets will just share the statement, but it's not a story. And if you want people to really have your attention or, you know, if you want to have people's attention, you need to tell them a story that interests them. So whether that means telling them about 
how you got started, especially if you're young. Use all of that to your advantage. And, you know, if you differentiate your product or if you differentiate your service in, in a certain way, that's something that is very helpful for business in terms of getting press. And I know that everybody out there is listening up to that because I think that that resonates very well, and I think that that's good advice to be able for the audience to hear loud and clear. Let, let's switch gears now. You know, we were so excited. I know that I was on LinkedIn, and I – I saw your post come across saying, you know, we are so excited that we're going to be on Shark Tank. And I thought, wow, you know, this, this guy's really doing it. And, and I was really excited for you. So why did you actually choose Mark Thank Cuban you. and Lori Grenier uh, over any other deals that, that were out there and available to you at the time? Yeah, I got an offer from pretty much every shark. Barbara went out because she was the only loan shark. Uh, Rohan and, and uh, Robert ended up partnering together uh, and made a really compelling case to me. But in the end, I, I kind of went in wanting Mark at the very least, and Lori would be a great caveat as well to it because you know, she's, she's the B2C side, and Mark brings every single side that you want. Um, so, you know, I went in thinking, you know, I want to get Cuban because I want to be part of the Cuban network and I want to be a Cuban company. And essentially to me what that meant was we had access to the entire network of every company that he's invested in. And a lot of people don't know this, but Cuban's actually invested in a lot of B2B-centric companies. He has a lot of business solution-type companies that he's invested in. There's another nanoparticle company that he's invested in. Um, and they're going forward. I mean, And so obviously you knew this going – yeah, and you also knew this, of course, doing your own homework before coming on to the show – can you tell us a little bit about some of the companies that, that he's also involved in that sort of helped you with that decision process that, hey, this is the person that I want to sort of network myself with and and yeah, um, and take absolutely. his offer over someone else's? Sure. So for, for to begin with, if you look up Cuban, right, like if you read his story, you see how he got started, which was already an inspiration to us um, as a team because we wanted we want someone that thinks the same way or has gone through the same kind of task. He took a he took one concept and branched it out into multiple, and that's how Broadcast.net started. And that's essentially what we're doing with Dashboard. We started with one product, we're expanding it out to be an umbrella. Um, and Mark specifically has invested in companies that are in the nano space, and we're a nanotechnology based company. So, you know, he's doing, he's done an investment, um, with global nanoparticle companies. Um, and then more so, he's partnered with Amazon, so he has an Amazon exclusive channel. Um, so that's really important to us as well, because that tackles some of the B2C side. And then he's also a public figure and, and a pretty big one as well. Uh, but more, more to that even, we have kind of, in the last few months, been able to approach companies like TD Garden, which hosts the Boston Celtics and the Boston Bruins. And we're trying to pretty much cover any fabric material, including carpet, in their stadium uh, in order to, you know, protect that and save them money in the long run from cleaning costs and replacement costs. In addition to someone like a TD Garden, you know, he has the Maverick Stadium. So that's that's very important to us. And he even mentioned it on air, even though it wasn't it wasn't shown in the in the airing when I was filming, he actually even mentioned uh putting it in there. Then he mentioned as well, or I mentioned to him, um, another focus that we've had is IMAX theaters. We've been talking to Jordan's furniture and IMAX theaters for a few months now, um, and the conversation has kind of halted um, since, you know, we were kind of just prepping for Shark Tank. But essentially what we want to do is approach a theater chain as well and be able to have them cover everything that they have because, you know, they want, they don't want to replace it every single year, and they don't want to have to clean it every single time. It's, it's cost and labor effective to them, and Mark owns a significant stake in Landmark Theaters. So for us, all these little small components we knew come along with being someone like a Mark Cuban, a billionaire essentially, um, and that's why primarily we knew going in that I wanted Cuban. And then on top of that, there is a small story tied to how I got the Shark Tank that deals with Cuban as well. So tell me about that. Sure. So about four and a half years ago, when I started Detropel, um, I had just learned how to do data mining. I was, you know, a sophomore in high school, um, and I taught myself how to data mine and how to pretty much analyze certain data online and do email hacking, meaning, you know, like getting emails um, and other marketing solutions where I was able to pretty much get press and get emails and get those – and email crafting especially. I remember watching a video by Chris Fraley, who's a VC out of Philadelphia, um, out of First Round Capital. He mentioned okay. – he, he had a Forbes article of how to get – how to get a hold of the top 10 busiest people you know. And when I saw that, it gave steps on how to write the perfect email. 
And mm. I took those steps and I emailed him and the founder of his firm, Josh Koppelman, and they responded to me. And so then going after that, uh, I realized, well, why not go big with the home? And let me find Mark Cuban's email and email him. And so okay. I got his email. I, I did a lot of surfing, um, found like four different email addresses for him and guessed a few of them. And eventually I sent him an email and he responded to me. And, it, you know, I was kind of introducing the product and he said, go ahead and make some and see if they sell. And I guess that I kind of came across, I emailed him in like, I think it was January, February, right when we launched to the market in 2014. And uh, he said, why don't you go ahead and make some and see if they sell. And I, you know, responded and said, they are selling, blah, blah, blah. And I mentioned Shark Tank. And as soon as I mentioned Shark Tank in that follow-up email, communication has halted because you're not, you're not allowed to actually have a conversation with the sharks before the show. I and got you. He introduced me to the casting producer. And they've been following my story for four years. So when we were finally ready to apply, we ended up applying this, hmm. this year. That, that's, a, that's an awesome story. And, you know, in terms of how you did it, in terms of, you know, this whole experience has obviously continued to show you that you really need to continue to think bigger and bigger and bigger. And a lot of, a lot of kids who were young like that probably wouldn't have either, A, come up with the idea to do it, or they would have thought that it was just totally out of their league, but yet something said, no, I, I can actually do this. Where does, where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I've been a really, really interested kid from early age. Um, you know, I don't come from a good background. Well, now it's fine, but, you know, I used to come from a low-income background, and, and a lot of that comes from some immigrant, you know, kind of mentality where, you know, my family came here for a better life, and I had a lot of focus. I was an only kid for nine and a half years. So for me, even though my parents got divorced, I had a lot of uh, focus put on me by my parents, my grandparents, and education was always a big thing in my family. Um, business or just, you know, being independent was a big thing in my family. So, you know, I wanted to be independent from an early age, and I got this kind of mentality um, early on, and I realized, like, you know, I'm young right now. I can rely on my family. I can rely on other people um, if anything goes wrong. And so, you know, I took I took a few risks. You know, I, I've, I've, this is my only business, and I've had businesses in the past that haven't gotten any press and that went completely south, and I lost money on. But, you know, I was never scared to keep approaching new ideas and, and being persistent because, essentially, for three and a half years, three years, I didn't have a formula for that. I was running the company not knowing what to do, not knowing whether or not I was going to close it down, and it was really just the persistence and the timing that was important because, I, you know, I didn't give up, and that's not something that everyone can do for three years. It's, it's I don't necessarily have a good answer as to why I didn't give up, but it's something inside of me told me, like, you know, just keep going, and it's just not in me to give up. Well, like I said, I, I, I love the story. As soon as I saw the video, I knew that I was going to have you on the show. But let me uh, first, before we continue to, to talk about that Trapel and your experience uh, with your pitch on Shark Tank, our next sponsor in our fast pitch round is TrustSmarter.com. <laughs> Are you setting up your estate plan, your will, your power of attorney, your living will, thinking of who to name as your executor, or setting up a trust and you need a corporate trustee? Head on over to TrustSmarter.com. TrustSmarter actually helps you find a corporate fiduciary that is right for you and your family. The TrustSmarter service is always free. TrustSmarter empowers you and your family about all things trust estates and trust company solutions. So. Get up-to-date information on trust companies. Fill out one easy form. Your data is never shared without your permission. You actually get personalized information from important things to consider when tr choosing a trust company, from fees to performance to the type of employees that are at the trust company to their assets under management to the types of services and the locations and important values that you can actually go ahead and filter and search on for you to find the perfect match. Trust Smarter provides all the education, the information about the fiduciary solutions for all things trust estate to planning for you and your family and business. Just head on over to TrustSmarter.com. Talking a little bit about Mark Cuban. How about as far as Lori Grenier? Because most of the times, most of the sharks go at it alone. You know, I, I guess the fact that she was willing to come into the deal itself was another added bonus. Can you can you tell us what your thought process there and, and how you were able to to get them to come in together? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, going in, I wanted Mark and Lori because, like I mentioned, Lori has the whole B two C side kind of tied down, and, and essentially what we're trying to do as a company is 
segment our business. So have someone who runs and operates the B2C side and then focus on the B2B side entirely separately. So that's essentially what we wanted to do. And I thought having those two would be perfect for that. Um, and Lori, obviously, I mean, everyone knows her credentials. She's, she's great at what she does. She's the queen of C2C for a reason. She has products that are doing hundreds of millions a year. Um, so, you know, we, we knew that she was the right person who can help on the packaging side, who can help on all the distribution side, on the consumer side, and, and that's essentially what we wanted to do. As, as far as what's next for Detrapel, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the different relationships that you're establishing. You know, we've, we've talked a little bit about that. But as far as increasing those distribution channels, what, what are you now going to be doing, maybe even differently even before Shark Tank, that you're now going to be able to do sort of going forward uh, and, and thinking bigger? Can, can you t- tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, i got to say, it's, it's a little – it's kind of like a <laughs> some pixie dust has been sprayed on us or something, you know. It's, the Shark Tank effect is, is real, um, and obviously until you get there, you don't, you don't really – know what to believe because there's obviously a bunch of companies that have been on there, but a lot of that haven't had um, success and, you know, there's different reasons for that. But for me specifically, being on a show like Shark Tank gives Detropel, the Detropel name, an actual brand. We're no longer just like a, you know, like our, our goal is to become a household name eventually. And to do so, you need to have opportunities where 5 million viewers on average will look at you in the span of 15 minutes. I mean, it doesn't happen easy. And if you want to spend a lot of money, then you can possibly get that done with, you know, some certain marketing strategies. But when you do it like this, it's very different. And I think now for us, primarily, you know, we're getting a lot of opportunities now. We've had a ton of inquiries, over 3,500 emails uh, within the first couple of days. And I think, been, you know, going through that, and a lot of those are questions about distribution internationally and, you know, other companies that are trying to resell the product or wholesale the product. And that's one great thing is that, you know, companies will come to us. That's, that's one awesome, you know, one awesome step of the game. But another thing that we're able to do is we're about to, you know, approach companies and say, look, like, we're a validated company. You know, you can either see us in charge things if you haven't seen us already or you have seen it and you've seen what the product does. Here's a sample. You know, test it for yourself. And we might not even have to do that. Um, and people will, will you know, automatically want to be a part of the business. You know, we were able to secure a, you know, an offer on air. And, and so know, instant, then, instant credit, really instant credibility because obviously Mark and, and Lori, uh, they, they actually vet the, the product and the solution. And I, and I guess that, that's correct. Right. I don't know. Do they, do they do a little bit of that before you actually get onto the show or do you get the deal and then they sort of vet it afterwards? Yeah, there's, there's a mix. Um, there's definitely an application beforehand that you have to fill out for Shark Tank, and the whole application goes through your business alone. And then, of course, you have uh, the deal, due diligence process once you close the deal. So, you know, you, you, there's like a two-step kind of thing for it. You know, you, you one, one of them is you give it to Shark Tank. The other one is you give it to the investors. Now, I know that before we talked a little bit about patents versus not having a patent. And so isn't there a fear with other competitors coming into the market in terms of other products, safety, repellents, working in different industries in terms of not only the, the B2B, but also the, the retail strategy, you know, trying to get into stores and, and other people knockoffs and, and other competitors? So how, how, do you, how do you address that? Yeah, I mean, um, it's kind of like the same story as Coca-Cola, right? That's kind of like the biggest one that everyone always brings up in terms of IP. If you're going to keep a trade secret, which is what we do, uh, we chose, we have chosen not to pursue um, a patent or other intellectual property besides you know, copyright and trademark. Um, and I guess for the most part, um, we're not really fearful of that for two reasons. One, we believe in our process and the way of which we make the formulation, which is what differentiates us. It's not just the product itself. It's the way that the retail that we, you know, the proprietary retail that we have, that is what is made custom, you know, by us. And so what, what is, so what would you, what would you, you know, in, in sort of pitching this to, to the sharks, your, your pitch was, that the proprietary process. To tell me a little bit about that in terms of what you feel is, is yeah. more proprietary in nature. Yeah. So uh, the pitch was kind of twofold, right? We we started off with the background of saying, look, I'm, I'm sure we're not going to have any knockoff to the P um, because of how we make the formulation. Um, you know, some of the sharks were okay with that answer. Some of them were not, as you can see on air um, in the episode. And so we I had to go deeper into that and. Essentially, what it came down to was, what's the real difference? Is it is it just the IP that we're focusing on, meaning it's the product, or is it also the execution? And for us, it's a it's a no-brainer question. 
it's the execution. We're, you know, we're trying to be first to market. We're trying to hit a lot of industries that have not been hit before for this specific sector. And our goal is to be there first, be there, you know, hard and, and understand exactly what we're doing while doing it. So we're able to do that and we don't have the fear of other companies coming in because we have that credibility now. And then companies that have credibility today, say like 3M, who has, you know, Scotchgard, for example, Scotchgard's got a ton of negatives to it. And we're exact, we're, we're a better product. We differentiate ourselves completely. We're, you know, we're safe to use. We don't ruin the texture. We actually work and we last more than, you know, a couple of weeks. We guarantee one application lasts the whole year. So, you know, we're not too fearful of it because we differentiate ourselves both on the product, but more importantly on the execution of how and to who we go to. But, of course, you know there's going to be new challenges on the horizon. So what what do you see coming up that you're going to have to basically deal with? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's obviously new competitors that come around or try to use, you know, our brand and retarget some of the audience that leads our brand, and, you know, target those people. And we're aware of that. But, you know, our goal is to enter markets that aren't even thought about just yet. And, and the markets that even are thought about, like the, the, the athletic wear or the footwear, streetwear, type of market, which is something that we, um, you know, there's tons of brands in, in that. There's tons of products already. Whether they're good or not is a separate question um, because, you know, we have to educate the user. And for us, the way this comes all down to execution, like, for example, you can look up one of our products or, sorry, competitor's products, um, Never Wet or even better, Crep Protect. Crep Protect is specifically in the streetwear industry. And our goal of tackling the streetwear industry is by going – and, you know, they're doing a lot of this stuff, too, but by getting strategic investors, strategic partners, and bringing people on the team who are able to move the needle in this industry. So, you know, we're about to start reaching out to public figures, celebrities, other people, and a bunch of people on the street that want to go ahead and hustle the product in stores. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of strategy to it, and it's all about execution. There's a boots on the ground strategy, and then there's the e-commerce place to it as well. So it's just about, you know, kind of understanding what you want to do and how you want to do it and actually going ahead and doing it as opposed to kind of just sitting back and letting the kind of like the dominoes fall. You know, as far as who they're actually continuing to pair you up with and, and sort of open doors for you, these relationships, though, it, it is, in fact, a long sales process, or it can actually be. So as far as who you have now and who you're going to have in the future helping you with the sales, can you talk to us a little bit about that process? Um. I mean, yeah, we're, you know, we're looking for tons of people that have experience in certain industries, and those are the people that we will pursue to join the team, whether that's in a, as an advisor, as an investor, or a partner. You know, it, it really depends on the person. Um, if someone has significant influence in the chemical industry, we'll, we'll obviously try to put them on our team because that's only better for us. Yeah. Who, who are they? Who are the sharks now that you're involved with? Who are they trying to sort of pair you up with now to sort of get you in? I mean, you. You mentioned uh, the theaters. You mentioned, obviously, the Mavericks. Obviously, uh, Lori Grenier has a relationship with QVC. I know that you really haven't. I, I had an on-air QVC personality I've interviewed already. Are you? Is that something that you're planning on possibly doing direct to the consumer market? Have you Have you talked to her about that? And can you Can you talk to us a little bit yeah, about we that? Yeah, we still want to pursue. We still want to pursue these types of markets and ideas. But our goal right now is, you know, it's only been a, it's been less than a week, it's been six days since, since our episode aired, and we're still getting ridiculous amount of feedback and an immense amount of orders. So we're right now we're focusing for the next few weeks on pursuing that and pursuing the wholesale orders that we currently have that have you know have come inbound. And as soon as that kind of slows down just a little bit, we'll start an aggressive outbound marketing campaign or just campaign in general um, and start pursuing some of these larger corporations like QVC. We'll start approaching theater chains again. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to go towards some sports stadiums. We'll see what happens. I mean, you know, it's a little too early to tell. It's only been six days since the episode there. So, you know, we're still gauging all the interest. We we did 100,000 in sales in the first 24 hours. And, you know, I mean, it's just uh, it's been it's been a fun ride, but we're, we're trying to approach it the right way, and we don't know what that is just yet. But, you know, as soon as it dies down a little bit, we're going to strike pretty hot. You're still actually going to college. What, what is it about Babson College that you're not the first alum, even though you haven't graduated at this point, to actually, you know, be on Shark Tank. I mean, they have a number of business students who have actually gone on to be successful on that show. So to tell us a little bit about the program, you know, because I, I think it's interesting that, that they've, they've had a number of people from the college and the entrepreneurial studies program actually go on to be successful on that show. 
Yeah, I mean, I think Babson does an amazing job at, one, recruiting individuals, and, two, keeping those individuals, um, you know, to they do a good job of getting good resources to these individuals. And essentially, for someone who's been an entrepreneur, right, going to school is often looked at in a different light. Like, a lot of people, you know, I always get the question, like, why are you still in school? Um, and there's several reasons to it. Um, but primarily, what Babson does, and I guess this is why we've had a pretty decent success rate all together in, in both, you know, Shark Tank and not, um, is that we have kids or, or students that are either already have been involved in business, they're interested in being involved in business, or they come from a background where, you know, business is something that they want to pursue and have the resources for. And Babson only plays up to that and, and gives you not only, you know, the education if you need it, but the the actual resources. I mean, everyone about Babson understands that our community is a very tight and close-knit community. And because of that, if you reach out to an alumnus or if you, you know, if you are going to reach out to a professor or someone, they're almost immediately willing to help you. And they'll give you the resources that, you know, that they have just by not even knowing you, but just by the simple association of the fact that you guys went to Babson together. So, who, know, who do you, very who do you say, that. yeah, who, who there has, has, provided you the the most amount of resources who's your your big contact or your big connection there uh, yeah, at the that's school that's an easy one that's an easy one for me <laughs> certainly a very easy one for me uh legendary professor joel schulman uh he's been an amazing mentor and advisor to me uh he pretty much is the reason i committed to Babson, and um he's helped me tremendously both within the business and personally no that that that's great um you know another thing you know we, we asked you the last time you were on were books and, and, you know, I, I love books, and, and so people go over to MitchellChatter.com slash books, and I have a book club there, and a lot of the guests, when they mention a book, I usually will put it up right there um, on that page. Can you can you leave the audience with, with a book that you really like? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give a big shout-out to one of my mentors who just wrote a book. Um, also an amazing longtime entrepreneur, ridiculously successful, Bill Green. His book is called All In. And uh, it pretty much gives you 101 real-life strategies that he has implemented. And this is someone who does not have a college education into growing a, you know, an eight-figure business or even he sold his company to Home Depot in the billion-dollar side. So, I mean, someone like that uh, gives you advice and writes it in a book and literally gives you step-by-step process of how to achieve the success or, you know, how to follow the process achieving that success, that's a really good book to me. So I, I'm a big fan of it. Um, I've read it, and uh, overall it's, just a, it's an amazing book and an amazing writer who wrote it. So. It's terrific, and, you know, we, we like resources here on the Listen Up show like that, and we'll, we'll be sure to link up to that resource as well for the listening audience. In this wrap-up round, it's actually sponsored by Banksmarter.com. Banksmarter It's a reliable resource for comparing traditional bank mobile solutions. So from online banks to alternative ways to bank, from credit unions to community banks to fintech and finserve alternatives to replace those big traditional banks, it's Bank Smarter. So how does Bank Smarter actually work? It it connects consumers to banking solutions that are delivered by the latest fintech platforms. In three easy steps, you, one, Fill out a simple form with your basic information. Two, you get personalized information based on the values that are important to you and your family in choosing a bank provider. And then three, they actually match you up with an alternative bank or digital bank from your from the various choices online, all while educating you on all things banking and the digital world. I know the last time we were here, you left the audience with three really good takeaways, and I know that you've learned a lot even since the time that you've been on the show last. Can you leave the show, the audience, with three additional takeaways that you've learned even over this last year, and then some parting word you'd like to also say as well in closing? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, one thing I definitely have to advise on is uh, be patient. Patience is key. Uh, be persistent. And the third one would be a mixture of be patient and persistent. Um, <laughs> And essentially, okay. what I mean by those is 
you know, it took me four and a half years to get to, to something even this small in the long run, right? I mean, this is huge for us, small in the grand scheme of things for a lot of people. Um, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of perseverance to not give up. So, you know, that persistence is kind of key. And if you're not persistent, um, you won't get the things that you want. And unfortunately, a lot of people end up giving up too early or too soon and not coming back to whatever they want, you know, in, in, in two months' time or something. You know, just as we're, we're closing here, I know everybody's going to go over to detropel.com. And, and we'll certainly have links to how everybody's going to stay in contact with you, not only on, on Twitter, but other social media as well, Detropel and, 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 of course, your name. But I really I really like that story about how you were able to um, basically, in essence, cold call, but you did it in an email. Is there any other insights that you can give to young entrepreneurs out there that are trying to get their foot in the door, that are trying to get that ball rolling, to sort of pursue in, in that same vein. Can you, can you provide another yeah. uh, practical tip? Yeah. Seriously, it's like very important that you're never embarrassed to ask for help and you can definitely continuously ask for help. Even, you know, us being a Shark Tank company at this point, I'm still asking for help every single day in many different aspects. I mean, people are willing to help you, especially if you're young. And even if you're not, there's going to be always that one or two people that believe in you and what you're doing, and they'll help you regardless. So definitely don't be afraid to reach out to them. Awesome. David, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We're so excited, and I'm really excited to see what's in store for you next. You'll you'll be sure to come back on maybe maybe once every year, year and a half. We, we'd like to – Obviously, keep in contact with you and, and see how your story continues to evolve. We're, we're really excited for your success and the team, and I know that there's going to be really big and wonderful things happening for you and the company in the future. So thank you again. We really appreciate you coming back on like this and, and following up on your story. Yeah, thanks again, Mitchell, anytime, and uh, be sure to come on sooner than later again. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be terrific, David. Hey, thanks so much, and you take care of yourself. We'll be in touch real soon. Thank you, likewise. Take care. Be good now. Bye-bye. Until next time, my trusted friend. <laughs> to my email list at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. You will get all the full interview transcripts, my ebook, 30 Tools to Start Up, where I talk about these free resources in show 006. You'll get the startup checklist, education and training materials, and other resources just by signing up at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Back at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up, help me boost the rankings of the Listen Up Show, the Startup Entrepreneur Podcast, by providing a well-written review in iTunes. mitchellchadro.com slash iTunes. It helps other people find the show. If you actually need instructions on how to do this, you can find that back at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Thank you so much for subscribing to my email list and providing a written review on iTunes.